Welcome to Equipping Leaders, a podcast where I share tools and perspectives to equip leaders in self-development and team connection. I am your host, Natasha, and I am excited to share today's episode with you. Our episode today is a conversation with leadership and empowerment coach, Larissa Thomas, on how you empower others and build strong leaders and teams. Good afternoon, Larissa. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Can I get you to introduce yourself and tell us your style of leadership? Absolutely. My name is Larissa Thomas. I am a native Californian, so I call myself a a Cali girl, Texas woman. And my style of leadership is servant leadership and change leadership. (laughs) Self-described. Oh, I love that. Could you... Can I get you to say more about that? Sure, absolutely. So from a servant leadership side of things, I'm definitely a student of Robert Greenlee and uh, servant leadership. So one thing I would say, I've modified or edited for myself. I took servant leadership a little too literal and sacrificed my own self care or personal leadership or personal branding in that thinking if I serve, it's gonna be this awesome thing. So I'd say servant leadership with some self care and courage layered into that. And then change leadership wise, I have been a change practitioner for a good portion of my career. And I like to see the biggest change happen in the leaders because leaders create the culture, leaders create the environment, they create the clarity, they create the strategy. So the stronger we have strong leaders, better leaders, better change leaders, the better the environment in corporate America that becomes from my view of the world anyway. I absolutely love what you said about the servant leadership. That's something that I know for myself, I will get on a tangent on because sometimes people view it in a way to get others to be so selfless yes. that they become identity less and they're yes. just part of this organization and they're just yes. still kind of a cog, but really it's appropriate boundaries and i always tell people like don't be more loyal to a company than they can be to you i always describe it as uh, loyalty is a bi-weekly or however frequently your paycheck hits <laughs> as a thing and the other thing i think that i learned later in my career when i really started to reframe servant leadership for myself was that service did not mean punishment to yourself So sometimes we over-index or overthink things about service, Um, especially in corporate America, it's very important for servant leaders to set boundaries because you can convince yourself that serving and doing and giving that the right thing automatically is going to happen. And we've all worked long enough now to know that equity doesn't necessarily mean if you do your job and you do the right thing, that the right thing is going to happen, not in corporate America. So I'm very tempered around what servant leadership means. There has to have some boundaries and you have to be clear about who you're serving and what you're serving and for why, you know, what the result is going to be so that you don't get lost in the, I keep doing this servant leadership thing and nothing's happening or I keep feeling dumped on because that happens a lot. I used to, in a previous job, I used to tell people, you can have 100% of me, but not 100% of the time. Yes. When I'm with you, I'm with you. Absolutely. Also, other things deserve my attention. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's, that's the perfect way to describe it. So you said you've been in change leadership for a lot of your career. You've studied servant leadership. So with all of that, was there a specific catalyst for you that all of a sudden you were like, I'm the leader, I'm the one in charge? I would say early on in my career, you know, right when the word transformation become a, became a real thing, I was in consulting early on in my career and what I found was I had a superpower or a gift of articulating to people what was going to happen next. So I found, and I could do it at all levels of the company. So I could do it for the functional leader and I could also do it for the person boots on the ground day to day delivering on the work. And what I would say was my catalyst for it is I got on a really large effort for a financial services company I was supporting. And the senior leader just thought if they sent one communication out, everything would just cascade and trickle down. And I was like, no, 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 (laughs) wait. He said, well, Larissa, if you care that much about it, just make it happen. Write up a plan and make it happen. And in my head, because I was a person that had been groomed in hierarchy, I thought, well, I can't do that. I'm not the, I'm not in charge. I was very comfortable with this leader. I said, you know what, I'm not at the right level to do that. And he was like, well, you're a leader, aren't you? 
And it was this, this general conversation. He, he wasn't looking at me. It was just, he was just talking to me like he trusted my work, trusted what I was saying, but he was like, look, I don't have time to take that on, but if you want whatever you need from me, I'll give you. And I just was like, well, yeah, why can't I do it? And from there, I just, I wrote up a plan. I said, here's what we need to do. Kind of started calling folks in the meeting. And we went from there. And honestly, Natasha, I would say that was a gift and a curse because I then realized that I had more than position power. I, I didn't have the position power at the time, but I had garnered the authority and the respect of everyone else. So I had garnered a different type of power with my peer set and the leaders. So that was the gift because people were like, I trust her, you know, she's got the authority, she understands what's happening. However, when I ran into leaders that were more position power driven, this was an issue because I didn't have the position power at the time. And I had not learned the skill set then that I know now of discernment and understanding corporate politics and navigating that, right? I had a few hiccups and bumps along the road trying to become this awesome leader without realizing that leaders that aren't as, you know, or managers that aren't leaders that are threatened by people that have that level of power and garner that authority don't necessarily treat you well. So I had to figure that out along the way. And then I said, oh, well, gosh, in some cases, I won't do this without the position power. And then in others, I've just learned how to build relationships so that position power isn't what's required in order to execute. You really drove home the point that, like John Maxwell talks about the five levels of leadership yes. and the lowest level is positional. Not that you didn't earn it, but you didn't earn influence. You were given a position. Yes. And yeah. so really with that ability to win others over, to be a relationship cultivator. Absolutely. That's what really gets things done. So with all of this amazing leadership experience you have, you have likely had some really great leaders along the way. I've had four bosses in my lifetime that helped frame and shape my view of empowerment in the workplace. So lasting impression, it was four different leaders. Listen, two women and two men. So there's an equal balance there. Gender is important to me in the story I'm about to tell you. So how they demonstrated it was for my female driven and the two male driven leaders, they modeled work-life balance. It was literally, they modeled prioritization, they modeled, you can't do everything in one day, you have to prioritize. They were very much about um, getting things done, kind of old school, kind of like the whole, like you can only do five things in one day, make your, sh your short list, prioritize it, execute, roll it over to the next day. But the work-life balance was a gift. Um, the other thing I would say they impressed upon me through how they modeled and how they led was air cover. Those four leaders were always like you have permission to fail, which was a gift. And the other thing that they did was they really talked through how they enabled me to do my job through air cover. So they said, ask you know, for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. They would say to me, if you fail, learn swiftly from the mistake. And then the biggest thing is just take accountability if you make a mistake, because then you can learn from it. And they were also leaders that told me, here are the catastrophic mistakes, that things that result in accountability and issues from a performance perspective. And here are the things that you make a mistake on and you capitalize and learn from and it makes you a better leader. I would say just their modeling that, the air cover, fail fast, giving me the space to be myself, telling me to ask for forgiveness over permission. Those were all game changers for me and having the courage to break out and try and do things. And then when I became a leader, it was important for me to model that because I realized, you know, I've been fortunate. I've had these four great leaders and I, I knew the difference when I wasn't working for one of those folks. So I had a really good friend of mine, she's passed on. She used to tell me, Larissa, you can do a very hard job with a great boss, but you cannot do a very hard job with a bad boss. So for me, learning from their experiences and how they modeled empowerment I started to take that into my own leadership brand. I decided I'm gonna be a leader that provides clarity. I'm gonna be a leader that models empowerment, self-care, balance. I check in with my employees. I ask them frequently. I treat the whole person. I say, I don't get to know you, like what do you gotta do with the results? I understand what folks' motivators are, what things that are stressors for them. So as we start to shape and think about their work, 
I can help them go like, so this you're really good at. Are you sure you want to take that on right now? Because this is a stretch for you. So we really talk about ways to set people up for success because that's what's been done for me. And I just, I dread ever being framed as a bad boss, to be honest with you. It could be ego driven, Natasha, but I would just die if anyone ever hated working for me because we're at work 70% of our lives, right? It's our big part of our livelihood. So it's my job to create healthy work environments for people. Yes. And I completely agree. That is, my fear is that I will somehow inadvertently create an environment where people feel like they can't tell me things, right? Or give me good information. Yes, and that's my fault, right? So there are things I have to not only be authentic and be the leader that they need, I also have to help them work through any negative baggage they brought with them as well and accept that Maybe other bosses have not been good to them. So yes. we work through that together. Corporate trauma is real. I, I tell people all the time, I'm a, a corporate PTSD survivor. I tell people probably too transparent all the time, but trauma in corporate America is real. And you have to understand if you're dealing with a person that's in recovery from it, you have to understand if you're dealing with a person that doesn't have a high degree of trust because they've been burned in the corporate environment. And one of the big things I learned I knew this before, but the pandemic really crystallized for me is we're human beings at work. We don't always, we try to depersonalize or or compartmentalize things and come to work and put our personal things on the show, but life is happening even while we're at work. And sometimes as a leader, you have to remind yourself, it's really hard to put those things on the shelf. So you need to have some grace and empathy with your employees and give them space, especially if it's a really bad thing going on or they're having a tough day, just have a little grace and understand people aren't masters at putting their personal lives on the shelf. That comes to work with them. You don't cease to be a wife, a mother, you know, a daughter or a caregiver when you come to work. Those, those things don't stop. Absolutely. I love to tell people too that a person who can truly compartmentalize like that is a sociopath and is to be <laughs> like that is. <laughs> I'm a big, I, I am a big fan of compartmentalization only from a decision-making standpoint, yes. but it helps me. Um, I believe in the rule of 10, you know, um, Jill Bolt Taylor, how does this affect you 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years? So when I th- say compartmentalize, I try to think and talk like that with my employees because sometimes it's just compartmentalized to help you make a solid decision and one you can stick to. But yeah, definitely don't compartmentalize to to lose your empathetic side. Definitely not. But trying to help yourself to prioritize because especially women, we find it tough to put ourselves and our families first at work because of the perception. And now I just feel like that is completely off the table. That chance of me missing anything that my children have going on for my job, not gonna happen. You know, we used to have kind of a similar type thing in the military where if somebody was really unhappy with their position, mm-hmm. we'd always say like, don't judge the rest of your career or staying in the military on this one thing. So yes. there is like some essence of when it comes to decision making, what if this element wasn't in play? So that yeah. formalization is Absolutely. Really- this is a basic trade-off conversation. And so with the corporate trauma piece, I think that the fundamental attribution error where we assume that there's a fault in a person versus a fault in the environment, I Uh feel like we're kind of emerging out of that a little bit, especially thanks to COVID, where we're kind of understanding that there's more nuance to it than that. So as we acknowledge that there are things going on in the environment and with the individual, what would you say are some behaviors or environmental factors that you look for when you're trying to help diagnose that and help walk a person through it? Well, I always look for culture in which we're we're working. So are we in a high stress moment or in the middle of some core key deliverables? Is this person the lead? Kind of what role they play if there's some environmental factor that's impacting them. I also look at kind of where they've been historically. Is this just today or is this a repeatable thing I'm looking at and we need to take a strategic pause and say, hey, what's going on? Kind of do a check-in. I also look for using my own EQ, I would say. I look for kind of how the individual shows up into our performance combo. So I have bi-weeklies on a regular basis. With my folks, some people that are working on more critical work, I have weeklies with. 
but I think I listen for calmness. I listen for, do they have a handle on it? Do they have the risk identified? If they're all over the place, that kind of creates worry for me. But if my employees have a handle on, hey, Lord, this is a risk or watch area. Here's what's hot topic. Here's what's coming up for me. Here's what's down the road. If they're able to really show me their thinking about the effort, I, I worry less. If I hear more sporadic uncertainty, I don't know it's chaotic or overwhelmed, those are triggers for me to kind of do a double dip in the check-in and make sure I'm giving them the kind of support they need. I don't want my employees to be overwhelmed for a long period of time. That's unhealthy for them and it's not sustainable. Absolutely. Stress is okay for a season, but if it's yeah. longer than a season, it becomes a pattern and yeah, yeah that person's gonna experience burnout. And I, I'm interested in your opinion on this. So of course there's burnout, but I've also seen people who for a season will perform at 150% and they're just absolutely killing it. And then it's almost like that's put on them as the norm. So then in yeah. my mind, I'm like, that becomes exploitation yeah. on behalf of the organization. But I'm interested in your, that's just yeah. something I just threw out there. <laughs> I, I was just talking thoughts. to a colleague about this, kind of this heroism in showing up. So when cultures create the, you burn both ends of the candle or you, you operate at the 150% level, what we're really saying is that we aren't uh, modeling or care for our talent. If I have an environment where you're working at 150% all the time, that means my environment lacks strategic focus. That, that is just my experience. If it is a grind all the time, that means we have no strategy and no priority. And the other thing is you wanna be in the fire prevention role. You don't wanna be in the put the fire out role all the time, because eventually the fire wins, right? So you wanna be in fire prevention mode. You don't wanna be in fighting fire mode all the time. That's an unsustainable approach. And if you can't ever get into prevention and mitigation mode, that really means you don't have a strategy. <laughs> it really does. It means you just, you will burn money. Companies will burn money. You'll burn your talent out and you'll repeat the process over and over again. You have to look at the value add of having talent work at 120, 130. That, that is not a normal mode of operation. And it typically means you either overworked, not capacity planned well, and you definitely have a gap in your strategy. And you know, the other piece to that, to make it a little bit more personal, because I answered you with a, a really deep business response. If I could offer perspective from an employee or a worker, the performer's response of it, if you're always at 150% and eventually the rewards slow down and you're actually branding yourself as the workhorse, that doesn't set you up for success. It sets you up for being the person that's the catch all when everything comes. They're like, oh, Larissa will do it. Oh, Larissa will do it. Just get out of Larissa. Give it to Natasha. Oh, yeah, they'll get it done. And then you, you look up and your peers have leapfrogged you. You look up and other people that do less have got promoted. And you're like, why? Well, it could be that that 150% is having a negative effect on your brand. It could be they think, well, gosh, she's burnt. She's always grinding. She's a workhorse. Leaders have to be strategic. Leaders have to be planful. So if you always show up like, oh, just hey, roll your sleeves up and get her done, you may not be setting an impression or a brand for yourself with the leaders, the senior executives that you can lead. They may think you're always going to be the worker bee. That is such a great point. You got to look at the environment and, and to what end? Why are you working at that level, at that capacity? Do your rewards match the work effort you're putting out? Are you being perceived as a strategic partner? Or are you being perceived as just a catch-all? You have to ask yourself, to what end? What value am I creating by operating this way? I've had the opportunity to be a moderator for a panel that you yeah. were on and you said something that I loved and I'd love to talk more about. Okay. Uh, you used the phrase, will versus skill. Yeah. So I am ready. Please tell us more <laughs> about that. So that is a main leadership staple for me and it, it became a part of my whole leadership formula, if you will, because when I first started to manage people, I didn't know how to stop doing the work for them. So I just kind of thought I'll carry it. And as I started to gain more responsibility in my function, what I found is I'm not doing you a service if I just do the work for you. And so what I had to start kind of reading into was, so there's will versus skill. I'm a very good teacher and I like for everyone to understand what it is they need to do and learn new things. So skill, 
sometimes you can acquire. Competence is something you need the basics to enter the game, right? But anything that you need to stretch and learn skill-wise, I think it, I can help you get there as a leader. Will, you have to have that. I can't give it to you. I can motivate you. I can create the safe space for you to work and ideate. But if you don't have the will to set priority, to set your time management, to escalate things or to discernment to know I should probably tell my boss that, or how do I mitigate this or what solution would I propose instead of complaining, I, I can't give that to you. So for me, when I build teams and I like to build high trust, high performance teams, will is something you have to come with because I now realize that my personality as a leader is like, I'll just do the work for you. And that I can't operate at that level anymore. I've gotten too senior, so that won't work for me. So if you don't come with the will, you're probably not a good fit for my team. Skill set, I can teach, make a plan, create relationships and connect you to others for areas that you may not know at all. But will, I, I can't give that to you. You have to come with, with that. It, it just creates a higher trust because People that don't have the will are always going to excuse themselves out of why they didn't do it. It doesn't help. You have to have the desire to learn. You have to have some discipline. You have to have the courage to step out and say, hey, I need to know more about this. What can we do? You can teach skill. Will has to be in you from the jump or emerge along the way. I can't beg you to show up for work. Like I can't beg you to stretch and, and bring your best in your A game. I can't beg you to do that. That has to be in you. And I also think that with will, it's there's a little bit of the you can't if you're a little bit unwilling, you're not willing. It's an right. on or off switch. Like you're yeah. you know, yeah. good or you're not. Yeah, and you might create change resistance. You might be a, a passive resistor along the way too. If you don't have the will, it might demonstrate or show up as passive resistance in some cases. Yes. And I've seen that those types of behaviors can derail a change initiative. Absolutely, Natasha, it can sink the battleship. You had mentioned also in there motivation. So what are your thoughts on motivation and how leaders can harness it? I think how you can harness motivation is to harness your own personal energy. So I, myself, for the last uh, two years, I've really been focusing um, as a coach and consultant to really pay attention to the energy I bring into a situation. So anabolic versus catabolic energy, making sure my energy and how I show up creates that excitement and motivation. If I come in and I'm doom and gloom, or I don't even, you, everybody's not perfect. I might have a bad day. I try to give myself the space to center and get myself back into a stable state because I've known for a very long time that my personality, when I enter a room, I can shift the dynamic in that room without even saying a word. I don't have to utter a word and I could change the energy when I walk in a room. And when I really did my own personal ego work, I found that really strong leaders, like I I treat that with care. I, I no longer walk in and like, look, it's, if you can't handle I'm having a bad day, it's on you. I, I don't walk in anymore like that. I go, you know, I don't know what else is going on in someone else's life. So even though my day isn't the best right now, I'm gonna try and really kind of go back to a positive space and bring a solid energy. And I'm also vulnerable about it. I don't hide it anymore. I don't try to be that superwoman leader. I'm vulnerable when I say, hey, you know, I'm not at 100% today. I'm gonna still give it a college try. Just know I'm not at 100%. So just kind of wanna make sure you are aware of that, but I'm gonna try to really make sure we can execute and have this conversation. So I create that safe space. I am a vulnerable leader. I'm honest with my folks within reason, right? From a professional standpoint, but uh, I like to create trust for my folks. I find that the more my team can trust me, motivation is just, it just happens. It's inherent. But if my folks don't trust me, you can't motivate them. If I don't check my own energy when I walk in the door, if I don't check my ego when I walk in the door, people aren't gonna follow you. So it's really about me waking up every day, deciding how I'm gonna show up and what energy level I wanna bring into the room. And I love that piece too about the vulnerability and mm -hmm. with boundaries. And I believe yes. Brene Brown said that vulnerability without boundaries is not vulnerability. No, yeah, <laughs> and I am not an overshare. Like Alyssa, I used to be a heavy crier and there's some days during the pandemic where that came up, but you've got to take a moment and take a breath. So definitely have some boundaries and I, I'm a late bloomer to boundaries. If I'm, I'm really honest, I'm a late bloomer 
to boundaries. I was the person that was like, we should just all tell him, be kumbaya, like share everything. No, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> Discernment is a gift, right? Like, so you have to decide. Timing is very important, and everything you're thinking and feeling doesn't have to be expressed. You know, I'm a big person that keeps post it notes or kind of stress relievers around my area so that you can temper your tongue. You have to be concerned about how you say and deliver things because once it leaves your mouth, you can't rescind it. And everybody isn't always willing and open to an apology when you're ready to offer it. And you don't you don't own or control how people interpret or process things you say. That is something they own. So you have to be mindful and be very caring about what it is you say to others and how you say it. I also really love that you mentioned that when you did have kind of something big uh, emotion wise coming up that you took that time for yourself. Oh yeah. You really demonstrate that self care. Cause sometimes people are like, Oh, I'll deal with that later. But you're like in this moment, I'm feeling it. Oh yeah. Give me a minute so I can move forward yeah. authentically. Oh yeah. And I have put my superwoman Kate on the hook in my office. I, I don't believe that you should show up and just put it all. Like, I, I don't believe it. You have to create balance. And as a leader, your team members are looking to you to create that psychological safety. You've got to show up with some balance and self-care. Like you have to take a breath. If I'm in back to back, I am no good. So I, I mean, I use the tools we have. I use Outlook, like, look, I'll be back. I need a quick 10. Some days my to-do list, Natasha, don't get past five things. If I'm really killing it, I'll get to seven. But it, in reality, because of the type of work that I do, it, it takes some really deep thinking, research, a lot of writing, action plan documenting. I, I don't take on more than I can deliver because I want to deliver quality. So I take breaths. I take breaks. Um, I've gotten really good now since I've been working from home for the last few years. Of I get up and take a walk. Over, I, I still get up and, and go eat lunch outside of my office at the table. I get up and go walk down the driveway, come back just to refresh because I have to be on for my team members all the time. And if I don't take care of myself, I can't take care of them. Yes, and with that, creating that balance and that psychological safety, to yeah. me, it also sounds like you're creating consistency yes. for the team, which helps them trust you even- And for me. And yeah. for me, because I work with senior professionals, right? So I don't lead a team of entry-level folks. And even when I, I led a team of more entry-level people, I treat my folks like adults because they are. So I'm like, listen, we're all adults. So I create space so that I don't have to micromanage because I am a horrible micromanager. I forget too much. I don't have time to micromanage. So I create teams that have space to say, Larissa, this is going on, I need a break. That is us having high trust. So for me, I have to create that environment on my team so that we can lean on each other, help each other. They know how to escalate things to me in a timely fashion and what things that, oh, that's really gonna tick Larissa off, she needs to know that. Or, hey, this is something, Larissa, if I go that route, I think she'll be fine if I set the solution and I tell her later. You have to create that space so your team members don't have fear of operating or fear of executing. They're supposed to eventually become peers or go on to some bigger, better things. That's the mark of a great leader. It's the mark of developing your talent. So I always look at that. And it first starts with that trust and psychological safety for me. So we've talked about self-care kind of through many of these things. Mm -hmm. So how do you prioritize self-care? And then how do you advise and encourage other people around you to do the same? I have gotten really good at using Outlook to prioritize it. But folks that work for me can tell you my calendar is color coordinated. I use the categories. This is health, mental health, personal uh, time with my family, personal development. I have a category and I kind of look back every week to see where I spent all my time. So that's one thing. And that wasn't something I'm, I have been doing for a decade. That did not become an atomic habit for me until like about five, six years ago. So I wasn't good at it at first. I had to build to it. And once I found a formula that worked for me, I just stuck with it. The other thing that I do is I don't try to create self-care based on what everybody else says self-care is. I have a, a good short list of what self-care is for me. So at work, self-care for me is that in a 40 hour work week, I need at least three hours for me to do some personal and professional development time. 
So 37 hours full on work. But if I don't get to read a blog or something in a newspaper, industry knowledge or something a few times a week to help keep my tool set sharp, help me thinking and ideating and brainstorming, I kind of feel like it takes me to a sunken place. So I block that hour three times a week on my calendar for me to read and discover and research things. I only have a few nights a week that I work late. I said it. Like I don't just go in thinking, oh, as it comes, I'll work late if I have to. No, I have two nights a week that I work late and it's not like into the wee hours of the night. It's literally into kind of a decent hour, maybe right up until dinner or right before. But I only do that two nights a week. And if I don't have to, I don't. But I set a stage and say, hey, and I'm vocal about it. Hey, this is my late night with my team. I'll tell them, if you want me to read something or I need a strategy doc, this is my late night, Tuesday or Thursday. I'll work until about seven, sometimes eight. Just depends. I don't do eight too often, but till about seven. And I tell people, hey, send it over to me. But if it's not Tuesday or Thursday, likelihood is that I'm not going to get to it. And you know, you teach people how to treat you, right? So again, I'm a person that was the, the workhorse. So as I tried to grow and evolve in my own career, I had to set those boundaries and rules for myself. People call them boundary. Really, they're my self-care rules. That's me protecting myself. And I don't feel guilty about it. I don't have to explain it. I don't have to tell you why. This has been a proven success formula for me to grow and evolve in my own career. And it's worked for me. What leadership advice would you offer current leaders in any organization? Uh, know who you are. If you don't know who you are, find out. You can't lead if you don't know who you are. You can't, because then you'll just, you'll do everything, you'll copycat, you'll have imposter syndrome, and it, and it won't stick. Know who you are. Know what your, your rules are, your deal breakers are. Because if you don't, you, you'll get mad about everything and stand on a soapbox, soapbox about everything and nobody will listen to you. Know your energy. You have to know what kind of energy you show up with. I'm a big person, um, I'm a, a coach and I focus on my own personal energy. Like what level of energy are you bringing to the environment? You have to know that. You have to decide that you're going to be a leader even on the hard days. Being a leader is not an easy job and it's often a thankless job. So if you're doing it, you're doing it because you know there's a call for you. You're not doing it for the visibility or the kudos. Because if you're doing it for that, you're gonna be disappointed a lot. It all starts with knowing who you are and knowing why you're getting into leadership. I love to tell people that I view leadership as a love story because you were passionate about something and you cared mm -hmm. about people. I like that. You have to know every day you have to show up and do this. You don't get to opt in or out of it. Do you have any books or resources that you recommend to others? Yes, I've been waiting for this one. The Brene Browns, the Simon Sinek's, and the Last of the World. Every single last book in my library, absolutely. Dalio, principles, like, yes, absolutely. But there are some books that I feel like shaped and changed my life. Okay, so really helped me hone who Larissa is, how she leads, how she shows up, what she's going to be about. So I got a couple. So as a leader, something that happened in my own personal life during the pandemic, and I found that during the pandemic, I had to coach my folks on career change. I had a, a lot of working moms that had to exit. A lot of working moms that were like, Marissa, I need to be at home. My kids are gonna start a business. And I literally helped and talked them through transition. So there's this one book called The Guided Journey by Mike Lee. This book was focused, um, and I'm a faith-filled person, faith-driven person. So it's finding faith, purpose, and joy in life. And this was pertaining around your career and how you work. So The Guided Journey was really a game changer for me because I, as, after I read it, I found the tools and things that Mike talked about in this book helped me help my employees think about career transitions and changes for themselves. And for me personally, it helped me reframe for the rest of my work years. Like I wanted a whole different environment and it required me to think about how I was going to change and the kind of work environment I wanted to create. And the book is amazing because it's not just a read, it's got some areas in there for you to actually fill out with complete kind of your own career path or plan. So The Guided Journey by Mike Lee is just one of my favorites. As I mentioned earlier, the other was Servant Leadership by Robert Greenlee. And this one, I go back and revisit often. This is a very old edition <laughs> because it was a gift to me right when I became a manager. And my one of my those leaders I talked about said, hey, I think you're going to be more of a 
a servant leader. And I think this would be a good learning tool for you. This helped me figure out how to lead and be an empathetic leader. Focus on business value add, but still serving. So I would say servant leadership by Robert Gillingly was a game changer. Okay, I'm getting to the real meat. Who's holding your ladder? Who's holding your ladder by Samuel Chan? It was about how you grow, how you help others, how you network, how you build relationships, and how you select the leaders on your team. Leadership and growth in a career is often more about the relationships you have than anything else. And if you aren't managing those relationships or thinking through how to navigate those, you're gonna hit some career stalls. So this book really just helped me understand that dynamic of leadership and how to grow and move and build other leaders without that political ickiness about it, right? So it really brought some authenticity to it for me about how you grow and how you develop. And then the last one, I wouldn't be a change person if I didn't give you a change book. So this is different from the beaten path of like Cotter and change management. This was about change intelligence. So you know how we've spent so much time in industry talking about EQ and emotional intelligence? This book by Barbara Trotling was about change intelligence and using the power of CQ to lead change that sticks. And my team member, one of my old empl employees gave, turned me on this book and I was just enthralled with it. She was like, and uh, she gave it to me and I just soaked it up because I thought, you know, EQ and CQ are right on the spot because often change leaders or change managers diagnose and see things way before other leaders. And they think, oh my God, this is like a Cassandra theory or Cassandra syndrome going on where you can see the future, but nobody believes you. So with change uh, EQ or change IQ, I really start to look at how to use that change intelligence with leaders I was supporting. Because it, I said, like, this is no good if I have this muscle and I don't know how to help other leaders learn it and teach it so that they can do it. Because I feel alone when I'm like, oh my goodness, that transformation is gonna fall off the rail. And the leader's like, no, how do you? And then three months pass, and like, how did you know that? So this book really helped me figure out how to start socializing and talking with my leaders about change management that sticks and how to look at it from a leader lens. Those are my four. Those are my big four books. I love it. Oh my gosh, I could talk books with you all day. <laughs> I know, you're my, my favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to reach out to you, how or where can they find you? Absolutely. So they can always get me on my LinkedIn profile, Larissa Thomas. I am on all the social media handles as well, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, so let coaches and my own coaching practice. So L-E-T-C-O-A-C-H-E-S. You can shoot me a message or anything like that if you want to ask on uh, follow-up questions or kind of where I coach and where I coach, who I coach. So I welcome any conversation. Folks trying to work in a healthy work, in, work environment, I'm always an advocate of helping people unlock or discover how to show up in corporate America if that's where they choose to stay. Thank you so much. This has been so amazing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you even asking and feeling like I had some value add to bring to the, to, to the topic. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Equipping Leaders podcast. For more leadership development content, you can visit my website, natashacheyenne.com, where you will find my leadership journal with dozens of articles and the Cultivation Cafe, which is always growing and has leadership frameworks, book recommendations, and inclusion and mental health resources. You can also follow me on Instagram at novel underscore Natasha or at Equipping Leaders Podcast and on Twitter at Natasha Cheyenne. Join me next week for another episode.